thing or the other. So we'll continue in the same line. We have, uh, we still have questions here, and the man of God will be answering those questions. Sir, are you ready? Oh, okay. So, um, welcome everyone to the second session. Sure, sure. So, um, so the first question I'll be taking here is, my wife and myself are growing in different directions. We do not share the same passions and dreams anymore. How do we get back on the same path? All right, praise God. Um, this is working now, so thank you. Praise God. Um, first of all, it's been a blessing being here, and um, I thank God. Thank you for sharing the time. Um, my wife and I growing apart in different directions. Um, there are two possible there are two possibilities two possibilities uh, number one is that somebody is either pursuing a vision God has not given God is not the author of confusion at all okay so one of them is pursuing either pursuing what God has not commanded or both of them are pursuing things that are compatible uh, you know this is not a question that a preacher man can answer in its full sense because um, they know. Nobody can be in disobedience that God speaks to and not know they are in disobedience. Um, we had a similar scenario. Like I told you, I like to use my examples both for the best and the, the worst case scenario uh, if I have just to make sure people know that you're not just coming here to preach at them. So when the Lord began to impress on my heart to do more of this, what we do, uh, I've been teaching. I got born again in 97. I spent my senior secondary, what you call high school, right, um, serving the Lord. So I've been born again since I was a teenager, serving the Lord, preaching the gospel. So there was a lot, there's always been a respect for me being a teacher, you know, and that's the person my wife married. So... Um, a lot of people do not know that the emphasis in this area of relationship and marriage is only as recent as like 2014, 2015. So when I began to go in that direction, it was the same season in church. There was a massive move for evangelism. So my wife saw what I was doing as something she didn't even regard. Like all the emphasis on relationship and marriage. Some of my friends, one of my friends even told me, we grew up together. It's like, God is doing better things. Me, I'm following this. I love you. You love me. Talk. You know, that's how it was downgraded. Like, you know, and for a season, I also felt the pressure, to be honest, because I'm a teacher. You know, uh, one of the temptations of teaching, if you don't allow the Lord to arrest you, is to come and put up a good show. So I can keep you here for three hours and shake you up and you go, my God, it was a powerful service. What did you learn? <laughs> Do you understand? So, uh, it, it also, I also had the temptation to want to remain in, I mean, teach, teach better things, teach the kingdom, teach. I'm still teaching the kingdom. But there was a misconception of, because it was focused on relationship and marriage. Then I didn't even have the voice to tell them, Do you see how many marriages are struggling? Or how many singles are struggling? I couldn't even tell them. So, you know what my wife did? She focused on church. So, she was. I'm with you, I'm with you, just in words. But here's the deal. I'm not God. And I should not coerce her because you cannot truly help me when I'm coercing you. So I left her to God. Lord, serve your daughter. Because if she's my help, we should be going in, in a common boat. All right? Even if she's the more in evangelism, it should not be that. I mean, I have programs, I'll tell her she can go to church. I mean, do you know what happened? The person I left her to solve that problem, the Lord spoke to her. The Lord gave her encounters that led her to repentance. So she came back and took her place in the ministry. Now right now, I tell you the truth, my wife intercedes greatly for this work we do. She teaches with me. I mean, we just came off classes. She's even somewhere teaching as we speak. You know, so that even the things I saw about her, she resisted them. I'm telling you, she's an intercessor, she's a teacher, she's a counselor. She resisted them. She was like, souls are perishing. I know souls are perishing, but there's a vision and a purpose God has given the family, which she left me in. She came to repent and she told me. She began to take her place. She began to perform her role. 
So it's either both of them have graces that can combine and everybody simply facing his direction. In which case they'll come to repentance and find their complement, what they can do together. All right? Or one is totally off the will of God because that's possible. Like you will just go and be doing stuff and here's the deal. God doesn't stop you because you are not doing what he commanded. And that's why I tell people that you are able to do it does not mean you should do it. Because there are so many things you'll be capable of but God has not called you to. You get what I mean? So, um, the person who is asking the question needs to start praying for both of them. Because what they need at this point is to discern the voice of God. They may be following ability and be lacking the wisdom to merge their callings, which is always God's intention. Because God would never call us in a way that destroys our marriage. Never. He's not the author of confusion. Any calling he gives, he will not destroy the marriage. In fact, this is the way I used to put it. God does not need the rubbles of my marriage as raw materials to build his kingdom. So his calling on my life will not scatter my marriage. So they are missing something. Praise God. They need to go in the place of prayer. Okay. Um, the next question. The desire for sex on both sides has greatly reduced in the marriage, mainly due to financial challenges. No concern for extramarital affair. How, how to navigate? I guess the person is asking, how do they navigate this? <laughs> how many young people do you have in this house? Because this question, can I answer it in this room? These people are tampering with something that is not supposed to be tampered with. <laughs> Praise God. I'm like, okay, sex in that marriage is like air conditioning in your car in hot Houston. <laughs> Imagine removing the air condition and you are driving at 2 p.m. in Houston for two hours. <laughs> Do you understand? They, mar- they are choking. The money is not the problem. If I'm surprised, because one of the things that frustration leads to is more sex. Because <laughs> you can't survive in life and survive in the bed. <laughs> Do you understand? In Nigeria, that's why there's a joke that poor people have more children. Because the only way they have fun <laughs> is in the bed. You can't go to the movies. You can't take vacation. So you go to the bed. Because you see a family living in two rooms, seven children. How are they doing it? How are you producing more babies? Do you get But here's the deal. There's a problem deeper than the money issue. That's the truth. See, and let me say this with every sense of responsibility from the word of God. If Satan notices that he can take key components of your life away by any type of frustration, he'll frustrate you more. Do you get what just happened? He just touched them. I'll give you a story you, are, you can relate to. So in 2015, we had our last baby in Maryland, Gettysburg precisely. While the family were waiting for me to come and pick them, we had no bills to pay. We had paid all our bills. I mean, that's the only child we had here. Our son created a medical emergency. Just, he was just playing. He was just being a child. So he put these shapes that they play with, and he got stuck in his throat. He topped it up like toppings of ice cream with a quarter dollar coin. So two shapes and a quarter dollar coin. I was back home. My wife was here with the children. And her sister was in the house when she went to get groceries. Bam, 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 she just kept knocking. I didn't know any neighbor in the four months we stayed there. You know how people do it. She was just knocking door to door. Thank God on the 10th door, it was a medical doctor. The guy just called 911 for her and got back in his room. He didn't think as much as where's the baby. So 911 took the, the, her son. They went to... Um, Shady Grove Hospital in Maryland. Um, without consulting us, they airlifted him in a helicopter to Georgetown Hospital. When my wife was just me, I just laughed. He said it was a glass helicopter. So they sedated him. He is fascinated by airplanes, uh, aviation and everything. I said, why was the boy not awake to enjoy? So my wife at that point was not thinking of a helicopter. It was how many minutes? I think eight minutes flight to Georgetown. They took it out. I mean, less than 24 hours, they were back home. They didn't even have to cut him open. But so I came to pick them. So every day I'll go to the mail, anesthetic bill, 
physician bill. Everything came to thirty-two thousand dollars. Thirty-two total. Um, <laughs> if you know about exchange rates, the bill was created when it was a dollar to one sixty naira. In a month after that bill dropped, was when the dollar naira flipped to three something, three hundred and something. So it was like sixty-four thousand for me. It was double. It was a few months down the line. Please, I say this with every sense of responsibility. I'm not trying to boast. It was a few months down the line. We're back in Nigeria when my wife came to me. I said, thank you so much for being a good man. She said the first fear she had, it was not historical, I don't abuse her. It's just out of fear, was that I was going to come on her. What were you doing that he did that? I said, madam, even if you are looking at him like this for money tonight, a child is a child. I am grateful my son is alive. Because I needed to choose my conduct irrespective of the circumstance. So she was surprised that all I did was to be supportive until I arrived in the U.S. She kept this thank you until a few months later that in Nigeria. She was reflecting and saying from when it happened, from when I was called, from when they were in the ambulance to the helicopter to coming back home till now I have not said anything that pointed to her. I said, wait, you should not go and get groceries. Your sister was home keeping them I mean, the focus was the newborn. Not this is the first child. First child went to swallow something. It's your problem. No, are you understand? We went through our toughest season. It was in the same season. Somebody we trusted and helped and helped got us in the financial situation. So it collided. So we went through like three years of very tough time. But here's the deal: God doesn't answer us with things until He answers us with peace. That's why in Philippians chapter four, the first thing He puts in you is peace. Because if he gives you answer without peace, you destroy the answer. That's why I say the God of peace will give you peace that is more than understanding. That means the peace will not make sense. This couple, see, the marriage is going gradually, to be honest. They need to sit down and restore their intimacy. Circumstances of life will not end up. <laughs> she had $32,000 happen, which is $64,000 as far as I'm concerned. Do you understand? Don't ask me how I paid this because it's a long story. <laughs> It's a long story. America has nothing on me. I paid them their money. Miracles happen. Don't ask me. Do you know, because I know I'm on record. Before they say, go and check my record. I'm not with anybody. <laughs> God has done it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, but that, that should not define us. Because Satan will throw things at you. It's just like when the boat was boisterous. What did Jesus do? He said, peace be still. Now, for this couple, not just sexual intimacy, one of the things I would say is you need to understand uh, Matthew 18, 19. It says, if any two of you shall agree as touching anything, for, for one of them to mention it, it means he's noteworthy. Something is wrong. So it's time to agree. I'll show you one scripture. I'll take advantage of this question to show that scripture. That's why I say there are singles in the room. First Corinthians 7, message translation. I know some of us have not seen it like this before. We shall see it today. To be relevant to singles and married. She, when I started talking, I told you I'm a teacher. So teaching is my responsibility. I will teach. First Corinthians 7, message translation from verse 2. Watch this. In fact, from verse 1 for context. Now, getting down to the question you asked in your letter to me, first, it's a good thing to have sexual relations. That means they are missing a good thing. It is a good thing to have sexual relations. But set, certainly, but only within a certain context, it is good for a man to have a wife. I don't know where you are from. A means one. And for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. Marriage is a container. The container can contain. So why are they not giving something to contain? Are you following my story? Hmm? It identifies the world as a world of sexual disorder. So the disorder you see today did not start today. This is our Bible. Shall we read on? The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife and the wife seeking to satisfy the husband. No time to preach this. Because every sex outside of the context of marriage is selfish and that's why it cannot please God. Because that one is seeking something for yourself and not seeking something for the other person. And that's why even in marriage, if you are not going to give, you are just going to take, 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 you have a problem. Let's continue. That's not the focus. I'm going somewhere. But teacher must teach now. Hmm? Uh -huh. Hey! This one. 
Something is about to hit some people in this America now. Something, something's coming, something's coming. Something, brace up, brace up. Sit, sit down, sit down, sit down. The marriage bed must be a place of maturity. The husband seeking satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Are you reading it? Are you reading it? America? Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. We are going through turbulence. <laughs> sit down, sit down. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out of bed. Abstaining from sex, this way I'm going to, I just give the other one so that somebody can receive something. I know people have received something. <laughs> ah, I know my right. I know. Thank you. No, ah, the Bible. I didn't say, I didn't say it's the Bible. Hey, what is? <laughs> Abstaining from sex is only permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it. Number one, test of agreement. If you both agree to it, where am I even? America cannot blind my eye. And if it is for the purpose of prayer and fasting, is this prayer and fasting? This is the purpose of frustration. This bed is being made cold because of frustration. It's not a ground. But only for such times. Now let's go to where I actually I'm taking you to. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. That thing you think you have reason to deny each other. <laughs> Before somebody just goes, hey, Johnny, Johnny. <laughs> you just realize that the denial going on at home is not normal. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you want to be, because Satan uses vulnerable moments to create temptations you least expect. Before somebody just shows up who is more caring, and you just feel like, oh my, no wonder, my wife can, I'm going through hard time, my wife cannot even, can encourage me, my husband cannot talk, look at this person, he's so caring, he's so, do you understand? So sit back and realize we have a problem. We used to do better when there was money. This one that the bed is getting cold, and guess what? If the bed is cold, the marriage cannot be warm. It is well though. Hmm? So that couple need to sit down. Of course, God will solve the financial issue, that's the truth. I, this, this, that one I can tell you, we can teach all the principles of work, all the principles of making money, but there's a favor of the Lord. Oh, that reminds me of Sammy's song. Well, um, one, of, one of our guys that ministers with us all the, all, all the time. So I just teach you. He's here to release it, but we have been singing it. We have been carrying it everywhere. The favor of the Lord I see. Victory of God is mine. The favor of the Lord I see. The victory of God is mine. It is mine. It is mine. See, I've seen too many miracles by agreement as a couple to allow any couple. See, you are, you are, you are, you are a quorum of power. If any two of you, I don't need anybody else to join our quorum. If we hold hands together. <laughs> so that couple need to know that it's not time to just be sinking into frustration. If Satan will serve you enough frustration, enough, but you will sit and hold hands and agree because if any two of you so restore the money, restore the bed, restore everything, praise God well, don't take it as normal hmm? thank you sir um, the next one money is a big issue in our marriage money again. <laughs> my wife complains that I spent too much on electronics but she spends so much on designers as hey! well. <laughs> Any <Shut> tips? <laughs> Any tips on how to fix? Okay. How many of you remember the teaching today on um, why and what? Here's the deal. Eh? Is the Reverend Matthias Onoja of Blessed Memory that defines misunderstanding as too correct understanding missing themselves? misunderstanding miss none of them is necessarily wrong but both of them may be living under lust what is lust what I want that God does not want that designer she's buying is God happy that electronic is buying is God happy earthly possession that fire can catch and burn <laughs> it's just insurance that may save <laughs> But, but here's the deal. Marriage is incompatible with selfishness. Don't forget where we read in 1 Corinthians 7. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. The truth is, the way some people live in marriage, they were better off single than to get married. Because if it's about me, I should not be married. 
from the day I take the oath of marriage, I made a declaration that it's no longer about me in life. Because I was good all by myself. So the moment I'm introducing somebody is because I have something to offer that person. So I am giving up me because I have chosen them. So marriage is placing the order above me. See, to both of them, repentance needs to happen. They are not putting each other above each other. And I keep saying this, if you read through scripture and the things we teach from the word of God, from the day you marry, none of you is as important as both of you. So both of you becomes, I happen to be a lawyer and I practice. There's something called a juristic person. When you register a company, the company can be sued and sued. The day you take the oath of marriage, both of you become one identity. So what they are doing is both of them are making the declaration of independence when there should be a federation. So this one is faced with designers. The first thing they need to do, and to the singles in the house, the, the truth is this. Anybody who's not ready to be economically one with you is actually not ready to live life with you. Why do I say so? Life runs on money economy. We're in this room through money. You're wearing what you're wearing through money. You live where you live through money. You buy what you buy through money. You eat what you eat through money. Your worth in life is defined in money, three terms. So if the central thing in life cannot join us, what are we doing together? We're pretending we're married. Because <laughs> that's the central thing in life. Money. The difference between this venue and another venue is money. The difference between what you drive and I drive is money. The difference between where you can afford to live is more everything on earth. So it's the central thing of life. So both of them need to come to repentance first of all. Like, if the central theme of life cannot join us, then we're in trouble. So we need to come to repentance. Because let's also put things in perspective. These earthly things we are talking about, how far? How far? These earthly things. So both of them need to come to, they need to purge themselves of these things. Because I can also tell you, that's the kind of marriage where people don't fulfill purpose. I, I tell you clear examples. Very clear examples. I won't do what I am doing if it's not the calling of God, I'm telling you, see, I have traveled this year, we still have travels. Some people think that, you know, especially people who don't travel, they just feel like, oh my God, he's just traveling the world. It's work and it's sacrifice. You See, I tell people, my wife and I are doing this ministry. We have dipped our hands in our pocket several times, break the pocket, we are looking for money in our leg. I'm telling you. So when I hear designer, designer, there are things that I feel I can't afford. Not that I can't afford it. My money is being diverted to a better direction. I'd rather come here let one soul be encouraged than to boast that I'm wearing something that's 50,000. For what? Where is he carrying me to? It's a local tailor that saw this thing I'm wearing. Are you not still seeing me? Am I wearing rags? It's not a local tailor. It's one of our team members. <laughs> but so that I get perspective to what I'm saying. You are struggling for designer. The person that designed has died. He's just carrying name. And you hope you know brand is just a, a way to, to deny the poor. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me explain. Let me explain. People who have to do something to prove they are something are actually nothing. Because people who have things don't use things to define themselves. Branding was made for the poor who have an aspiration. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. So Obama will tell you that he has the same kind of colors so that he doesn't struggle. Then Mark has us wearing designers to compete on Facebook when he wears. We will have things, but things won't have us. So both of them need to come to repentance. God wants us to enjoy the good things of life, but the good things of life should not have us. It's so simple. See, there are points you come to a level. See, if you are going to fly a private jet because you need to fly a private jet and can afford it, you don't even make news. But who snaps private jet and put those who fly it occasionally? Those who fly it every time don't have time to snap it. <laughs> so the man wants electronic, electronic to what? Electronic to catch fire. She wants designer, designer that. <laughs> so this thing should come natural, but it must come on the plane of agreement. That's selfishness. And that selfishness, you're just hearing the one of designer and electronics. When you dig deeper, the selfishness is killing them. Because the bond of the marriage is gone, the unity is gone. The togetherness is gone. The fellowship is gone. All of that is gone. So they need to sit back. First, start with repentance. I have been attached to things. And that's why the first test Jesus gave that young man who came to him, the rich young ruler. Mm. The Bible says Jesus saw him and loved him because he saw in him that he loved the Lord. Then Jesus gave him the only test he needed. 
He said, go now, sell everything you have and come and follow me. The guy said, at that point, sir, I'm done. He couldn't. He couldn't. So both of them need to repent. Praise God. Thank you, sir. Um, I am divorced, and I would like to remarry. I am still going through trauma, through the trauma from my previous marriage. Where and how can I find help? Praise God. All right, first things first is um, speaking about this is where the help begins. Identifying that it's trauma is where the help begins. Let me, let me use my example not from the perspective of remarriage, but from the perspective of being from a broken home. Um, I know some of the things I'll say now are sensitive, but I'll just be honest because that's the journey. I have a good relationship with my dad now by choice, not from emotions. Otherwise, with the issues that happen in our family, um, emotionally, I shouldn't. Let me say the much I can say. So I had some tough time that collided with the $32,000 period also. Okay, so my dad's a very senior lawyer, top popular lawyer in Nigeria, um, doing well for himself. I always use him and salute him for the grit that he has in life. I was actually born to a mechanic, an uneducated one. But today is at the peak of our profession. By dint of hard work, determination, no godfather, God the father is his father. So when people speak about family systems and they mention the negatives, not because the whole system is useless, but here's the deal. And I'm going to just keep it as straight as I can. So a few years ago, I began to have a strong rethink which would happen to you if you submit to Jesus. And I began to realize and come to terms with the fact that um, the law of honor demanded of me to honor him in spite. And I had been away, I had been away. We had seen, for a season, his house is a distance I can walk from my house. But for a season, we saw three times in two years. Two was in court. He was coming for another matter. We met in some court where we meet. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. I'm, a, I'm first child, first son. I've never told this story this deep. You know, one was at somebody's wedding. But he began to get really impressed on me that I was wrong. Not because the details were wrong, but because my reaction was unchristian-like. So, one of those days I went to visit him with my family after church. It co coincidentally, it was even a Father's Day celebration. I heard a very tough message and I said, let me act on the word of God. I have every justification to keep acting this way. And he asked me to the face, what are you looking for? And I said, I came to greet my father. He said, now you know you have a father. In front of my wife, she, he washed me for 30 minutes. Real washing. The kind of washing you stand up and say, you are not my father. <laughs> washing. Went through that. Uh, other circumstances happened. I just kept at it. He had a celebration. I took wine. I went to say congratulations. Another thing happened. I went early morning again. Then he looked at me and said, enough of Satan. Then we had a conversation. If he had his way, he would get me back to his office, which I left 2017. I still maintain my office, but we work together. We are currently on a major project together. Life is good. Can you fix the past? No. Can you heal the future? Yes. Where does it begin from? The thing that people hate to hear the most. Until you learn to forgive. Forgiveness? Forgiveness has nothing to do with the offender. Whether the offender is sorry or not. In fact, the height of it for me is when we come to him and you look at me and say, I don't know what I did to you people. The offense will just go higher. You don't know what you did to us. Because a lot of times we are not letting go of the past so we cannot capture the future. Because the only way you can capture the future is to treat the past as gone. I forgive you. You were the one who hurt me. How many of us here have listened to Joyce Mayer? I know sometimes we just flash the situation of our abuse. Her father abused her to the point that on a certain day he was abusing her in the car. A cop caught them. He offered his daughter to the cop so that he would not be arrested. The cop also slept with her and allowed him go. When Jezmeya speaks about forgiveness, please listen. When Jezmeya talks about forgiveness, go and pay attention. When I see some people struggling with forgiveness, I, just, I have some messages of Jezmeya, the links to the YouTube. I just sent to them, watch first. Because I deal with some people sometimes who give me all the justification why they cannot forgive. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the offender. It has something to do with my release. And how do you start the journey? 
It's a long journey, but I'm going to show you. This is the journey. Bless the very person who offends you. Mm. See, I began to take time. Everybody I had justification to hate, I'll spend time in prayer. Lord, I bless Mr. A. Thank you, he will live and not die. No evil will befall him. I decree the blessing. Yeah. Day one, hard. Seven months in, hard. One year in, is becoming easy. One year, five months, is becoming easy. Lord, I bless my ex. She will not die. She will live to fulfill her destiny. Let me say something to you about your ex that you have children with. They are still the parents of your children. Let me say something to offended, I don't know who you are, offended mothers who are damaging the father of your child to your child. You are not just doing something wrong to the past, you are destroying your child. You are taking away from them the capacity to honor a system that God commands them to honor. Number two, you are taking away from them the capacity to embrace the future because your story repeated too much to that child corrupts their view of the future and they cannot believe in love. So you think you are damaging your ex to this child. You are damaging the child. Your ex is gone. That's where your journey begins. So as painful as it seems, my wife hurt me. My husband hurt me. Lord, I let them go. They will live and not die. And I'm not talking about live so that they'll say, ah, do well so that I can hurt them. I'm not looking for hurt. They will be fine. They will be fine. That's the mother of my son. That's the father of my son. I told some people, if you don't have any incentive to pray for your ex-spouse, pity your children who need a good example. Let that ex-spouse come to repentance and say, you know what, son? I'm wrong. I'm a bad example. Don't live like me. Not one that you people fight and fight and fight and fight, fighting over their head. So the journey to the next begins with dealing with the ex. Do you get what I mean? So before you go into this, because this is why, here's the deal. Anytime you don't deal with it from within you, you are not equipped to have a better life. So you are wondering, why am I not getting it? Because I need to approach this new life with a wholesome personality. So you are bringing a corrupted person trying to have a new experience. That's the problem. Because this person cannot have a new experience. This person needs to first of all put the past where the past is. And let me tell you, using my story, this is why you see people offended at their fathers and repeat the patterns of their father. So I knew I needed to let him go. Guess what? Do you know I stumbled upon a good reason? It sounds like excuse. To me, it's no excuse. Though. Do you know I came to the point where the Lord opened my eye to see that he gave the best he knew? All right. The same person I was fighting was giving me his best. He didn't know better. What he gave me, if I still giving it. <laughs> I'm telling you, my father, if, if you like, let him watch it. Daddy, well done, sir. He, my father, <laughs> he's thinking, my dad's a tough man. With all his worth, man, get on the street and get something for yourself. I'm t- my brother knows. This has been my long-standing friend. My father, if I tell you what my father is worth, man, get on the street and go and find your worth. He's that kind of man. He, he, my father spoils you with money. You, are, you can't find it. You, you will live my, with my father now in his current worth. You think he's broke. But the thing I can't take from him, walk and see, he will pay you well. But that he's just sending you money, you're joking. So I began to see. See, God opened my eye to see where he was coming from. The curriculum he received is what he delivered. Because sometimes you are not forgiving because you are not making enough excuse for why the person is what they were. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, the journey to the future is to look back at the ex and let it go. You cannot get to the future holding on to the past. So deal with the past. That's where it begins. When you deal with the past, you realize that a wholesome person is ready to approach the future. Praise God. Yes. And the questions are still coming in. Um, So this one is related to the one you just answered, but I'll just read it because... Brother Joel is going to hate this. If these questions keep coming in, we are going to pay extra. (laughs) Brother Joel doesn't like money talk. If this question keeps coming in, you pull contribute. <laughs> so, I am sorry, them now, voice people. You people don't like to talk about money. Do you want us to answer the questions? Yes. Will you support us? Yes. I know it's free program. We do not trap you to come and give us money. Huh? It is free, pro- it's free, free, free. But hmm? well, it's money they have to do to free things. Hmm? <laughs> Should we keep answering the questions? Brother Joe, I get the invoice. <laughs> 
Um, so this is related, but I'll just read it so that I don't offend the person that sent it. Um, how can you heal from a traumatic marriage and move on into a healthy relationship or marriage? This is coming from someone that had a traumatic childhood. I think you've answered. Yeah, this is yeah, yeah, just read it. Um, next one. How do you get past comparing your ex to your new relationship? You loved your ex so much, but he left you. You know you need to heal but you just find hard. I think you've also answered it. This, this is quite related mm -hmm. to this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you've answered it already. Um, so let me just... Okay, so moving on to the last few questions. Once I tell a guy that I am waiting till marriage to have sex, they leave and stop trying to get to know me. I'm high on the wrong path. How do I approach this issue? Congratulations. <laughs> he has done it for you. You will come back with a new song to sing. God is good. You will come back with a new song to sing. God is good. Oh. Congratulations. God is good. <laughs> when somebody gives you a response, they have just told you who they are. For a Christian relationship, having sex should be a temptation that we overcome. Why? You know why I mentioned that? Because sometimes people now run away and say, no, then they go and marry somebody that cannot perform when the hour of performance comes. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> do you understand? So for a Christian relationship, it should be obvious that marriage is a very sexual relationship. It should be obvious that there's chemistry. I want you. Do you understand? But if he has given you that the rules and the laws of oppression or of engagement in his life is to do before they do. Remember all I was explaining about the honor code and the principles relating to fornication. So the problem is not that he has activation towards you. The problem is that he wants to activate the activation now. Because you have not finished buying phone. You want to unlock it. Do you understand? That's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. So, but here's the deal. I teach that ladies should get comfortable rejecting a lot of people. Why? More people will approach you than you can marry. You are going to marry just one. So stop judging your circumstance by how many you have rejected. If a dog comes, reject the dog. I'm sorry. I didn't call anybody a dog, but I'll give you scriptures. If you go to Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 2, you know what happened. When God said in Genesis 2.18 that it wasn't good for man to be alone, I'll make for him a helper. The next thing he saw was animals, not woman. In verse 19, God had casted the picture that it's not good to be alone. Then the next verse, he started seeing animals. Because God wanted to test him with the test of rejection. Because the only way you can stick with the one is to reject the ones that are not the one. So my sister, get comfortable. It's a sieving process. You are simply reducing the number. You are getting closer to the one. And let me say this to you. For every lady under pressure feeling like, I don't know if there are any good men in church again. You are not the first person to cry. Your brother, the prophet, cried. I am the only one. God said, shut up. There are 7,000. See, there's a remnant for the remnant. Hello? There's what? The remnant for the... The reason you are meeting many bad ones is that the bad ones are much. Even the way that leads to salvation is narrow. Is the place that leads to death that is large. So some of you are wondering, that your classmate that partied hard is married with three children now, you are still waiting, no problem. Is th that road is very easy. Do you understand? Because to enter man's house and go and collect is easy. You are not entering man's house, so it's looking like the journey is longer. Because believers need to, see, believers need to get at home with persecution. Be comfortable with it. Persecution is one of the things Jesus promised us. Read the Bible. Is there anybody who lets go of possessions and lets go of this and that to follow me will in this life and the age to come receive rewards? He mentioned reward and added persecution. I don't understand why Jesus was doing like that. He added persecution as part of the reward we receive. So my sister, every man who does that has just shown you a standard. I'd rather you get in with righteous standard, meet temptation and start asking how do we overcome temptation? So don't run away just because there's chemistry. You are running away when somebody shows you that, look, I operate by a different principle and the principle is not kingdom. All right? So, but there's a remnant for every remnant. There are 7,000 who have not bowed. I'm telling you, you will meet a man that will shock you. Like, ah, uh -uh. oh boy. 
Are you okay? I am okay. <laughs> Nine months into the marriage, you know that I'm okay. <laughs> God. I think we are Roger, signal me. Where, where are we? Yeah, so we have just two questions left. Are we permitted? Count. Okay. Uh, my sister is in an abusive, abusive marriage for nine years with two kids. My family worked to get her a student visa to Canada. Husband is flaring up, saying she is abandoned, abandoning her kids and has been violent lately. She leaves for Canada next month, and she has been feeling very bad because of what the husband is saying. Unfortunately, it is a bit late, but the family mishandled the situation. Evading an issue is not solving it. Because she's leaving behind a valid marriage. So there are, all manner of complications are here. She will get here, she's still tied to a marriage. Do you get what I mean? He's tied to the marriage. They're, so they're just stealing her out of the situation, but not necessarily giving her a solution. They should have confronted it differently. If they're going for counseling, they go for counseling. Now, oh my God. Oh. It is so hard as a minister to talk about divorce. Very hard. But if I pretend that there are no grounds to ever talk about it, I'm lying. Thank God I'm not directly in any church. Now, it's when I preach in churches that I have the greatest restraint so that I don't offend somebody's doctrine. <laughs> Do you understand? But any tree that does not bear fruit, even our father cuts down, I will say no more. Go and read Kenny again, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. I recommend that book. If they are so sure they have explored every other means like I said earlier, the covenant of life is stronger than the covenant of marriage. I don't agree that they should just steal her away. That's a problem. The marriage is still there. They, indeed, she's abandoning the children. So she's not even help. Besides her marriage, she's not helping their future. So I wish the family intervened another way. That's the honest truth. Besides just plucking her. What's the plan for him? What's the plan for the marriage? What's the plan for the children? No plan. Do you get so um, I, I really wish, but since she is in this situation, they still need to do that. They still need to sit as a family. What's the future of this marriage? Is there a solution? Can we find the solution? Can they bring them to any form of accountability? That's what they should be doing. Because they have now created more questions than answers. Where's the future? What is next? She's coming to Canada. Are they going to use that as a route to stay? What will now happen? What about the children? Are they going to try to get the children to move? I mean, it's a lot of complication. They need to go and confront the monster in the room. Oh boy, you cannot be doing this. What's the way forward and all, right? Thank you, sir. So last question. What can I do? Someone just dropped another one. <laughs> what can I do if my husband does not have sexual drive and I know he is not cheating? Okay, this couple will need to see counseling because the questions that will come up is, did he used to have? Where did the team travel to? You know, these are, there are questions around, there are questions around this. It's not, the question is a bit too, um, the, the, question, the question is a little vague for us to, I know the committee are meeting now. <laughs> so let me move away from the committee. Let me, let me stay. <laughs> So the question is a little vague. You want to be sure because if he's losing steam, just like I said earlier, something's wrong. You don't just wake up and lose steam. And a lot of times, unfortunately, people think that, okay, my partner is losing interest in me. It may not be you. Do you get? There, there are people who have come to the point where they are overwhelmed by life. All right? So at that point, it's not about him. Do you get? There are men who, no matter what they are going through in life, their sexual drive can never go down. I never go down. Do you understand? So for this one, it may be something unconnected to the wife. Do you get what I mean? So let me just answer like. Let me take the assumption that the sexual drive was okay and she's asking this question because it's dropped. She needs to investigate the circumstance in his life leading to this. Do you get what I mean? In fact, the truth is, I, I once participated in a forum 
where somebody used, oh my God, it was so funny to see, but the man, the man used a picture to drive home the home, the message. He just put a picture of the Eiffel Tower gone down. <laughs> because he was talk, talking about erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Eiffel Tower that is standing for 100 and something years, bent over like melting wax <laughs> like this. So some, there's a heat that is getting it this way. And until you identify the source of the heat, you will be looking at the falling tower and not realize that it's not about pulling the tower up. It is... <laughs> some people are laughing at me. <laughs> it is... What is the source of this form? Once you get to... And guess what? Oh, Hey, ladies, are you ready? Sometimes the wife does not even know the role she's playing. Do you know fear, anxiety, and the sense of failure can kill a man? Do you know there are wives who don't know how to handle and the man is tired, he can't talk. You just hack him down, hack him down, talk him down, talk him down. An average man is already afraid of failure. An average man is already aware that the car that a fellow man drove next to him this afternoon suggests that he has failed. That man is succeeding. <laughs> Then he comes home to a wife who is hacking down, hacking down. Do you understand? So there are so many things that may be the source. She needs to find what happened. And a lot of times, it also takes the boldness to ask the same wife, or the same husband, like, what is going on? Not from a pressure perspective, from an investigative perspective to know, like, what exactly may be wrong? I'm open to discuss this with you. I know you are not like this. I know you may be going through something you are not talking about. Even if it is me, please talk. Hey! I know a woman is afraid to ask that. Even if it's me, say it. All right? This one, Brother Joe, is here. Brother Joe has allowed us to hey! <laughs> go for the next question. <laughs> um, the question says, can you talk about a man's role as the provider for the home and family and a woman being the supporter in this day and age? Hey. Let me start by saying I married my wife when she was earning 10 times my salary and the person that was paying me that poor salary was my father. <laughs> so, 10 times, I'm not kidding. Here's the deal. Support is larger than we have defined it in the traditional sense. For instance, let me go back to Mama Maya again. I love the woman. Joyce Maya is on TV because of Dave Maya. That's a help. He has offered a help. But we always see help like the woman must always be the one who does something for the man. It is what I say to one, I say to the other. I I'll come to the specific money thing. So what happened? Joyce, I mean, look at the history of Joyce, first of all. Joyce explains by herself the mess that she was making the marriage with Dave Mayer. She explains it herself. First of all, he withstood that and stood with her. That's level one. Then when he began the conversation of her being on TV, and she laughed it off like... <laughs> He set it up before she accepted. I've, I've seen the mayor teach you. He can teach you. I've read a book he wrote. Too. He can write too. But it's a man who boldly took his place and released that into her own. So when it comes to this issue of help, before I come back to finances, is that each person needs to understand where is my strength and how can it aid my spouse's strength. That's the concept of help. So if you over limit it like the man has the frontal purpose, the woman must come from behind, there are women who would be the face. And the man would have taken his place in life by being behind. Do you get? Now come to money. The scripture that is the commonest that people use is 1 Timothy 5, where it says, He that cannot provide for his own household is worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. They are using it to put pressure on us. <laughs> Let the men breathe. Tinubu has come to, has come to Houston. <laughs> now here's the, here's, the, here's the truth about scripture. Go back and read that scripture number one. I will soon come to the man, oh, please bear with me. Number one, that scripture did not refer to male or female. Number two, it was not referring to immediate family. That body is so large, it was referring to cousins and extended family. That's the same scripture that began by saying if a widow is not up to 60, she should not be a burden to the church. 
so that they will not give her support, welfare. Then she will go around sleeping around the church. She's still young enough to marry. Do you get what I'm saying? So it now comes to the point of families taking care of family, where we are mutually responsible for one another and say he that cannot take care of his own house, household. Do you get what I mean? Now let's come to perspective. Oga, okay, you are the leader of the home, lead. That means you provide. My father and the Lord used to put it this way, and I agree with him. He said, the man must provide, the woman may provide. So that the burden is not on her. Like right now, by the grace of God, anything my wife wants to use her salary for is her business. So that's what I told her. But guess what? She's such a good woman and enters the family. But I don't count it in the budget. And I'm returning her trust. Because there was once a time we were living on... <laughs> Ten times, I'm not kidding. But I give you a very practical story. So in the wedding process, which was funded by my father, by the way, if I, when we had problem in the process, my pastor's wife heard my ear, as you are joking. Yeah, his first child, first son, what is he doing with money? I was working for him. I married within a year of leaving the law school. He was the one paying me the salary. You know how many years I got a salary if I can marry wife? Girl, I've been dating from university. So we used to sit down and plan, but we know who will pay, me and him. I left my father's house two weeks at my wedding. I don't look at me as irresponsible. I'm not. <laughs> I was even helping because he lost his late wife and I was taking care of the younger ones. So I couldn't even move. Please calm down. So here's the deal. We're coming for our honeymoon. Which one of my classmates was a politician? I used to lecture him when we were in law school together. He came to law school as a politician. So I used to give him tutorials. I mean, I have brain. He has money. Exchange. Do you understand what I'm saying? So towards my wedding, he just called me up like, where are you doing honeymoon? I said, no plan, no. He sent us somewhere. Very beautiful. On our way from there, my wife had gotten a job with the federal government. I know it doesn't happen in America, but in Nigeria it happens. For like five, six months, the same federal government you are working with, maybe they are trying to regularize your name in the system. No salary. In fact, you start doubting whether you are employed. <laughs> so my wife had been working for six months. No pay. So we were coming back from the honeymoon when the notification of payment for six months, imagine five, sorry, five months salary, and that once. Something that was 10 times my salary. That's 10 times 5. That's 500. <laughs> Is it, I mean, I mean, do you get what I mean? Guess what? Even that wedding that they helped me to do through crowdfunding, I was still owing some bills I had not paid. That's the first thing we solved, though. Because we are one now. So here's the deal. A responsible man will not demand money of her. But a responsible woman will not keep money that the family needs. Do you see the balance? So I'm going to stand my ground and walk my life out if need be. But if she's a good woman, she can't watch me die for needs that she can support. Do you get what I mean? So I'm not putting the burden on you, but I'm not letting you carry the burden alone. So I tell people, if I do scripture and I do kingdom, I cannot come and say, okay, let's share B. You pay rent. You pay rent. I pay B. What? Me? Son of God? No. 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 I'm not preaching this as law. I'm preaching this as my understanding of scripture. Because I'm the leader here for a reason. So that's why I should pick the right woman who can do what she's... I'm telling you, the moment they entered, the first thing we cleared, because we were so financially open with each other that she knew about that bill that I was spending that I couldn't pay. It was a friend that gave me some money to quickly do something towards the wedding, and the money I expected to give him didn't come. That's the first thing we cleared. Guess what? Our early days were funny, let me not lie. When salaries enter, her own enter, we sit down, we draw a map. Week one, week two, week three, week four, we share the whole month. In Nigeria, you plan for every fuel for the generator because there's no power. So we write fuel, we write upkeep, we write, and we we're so dramatic. But it gave us this bond. That's when, do you know we opened our first joint account as university students when we were not married? We were in a seminar like this and somebody talked about joint finances. We were so convinced. I don't know how the bank answered us as a married couple. The account is still there. So when we got married, we now open the one. Now our joint account for marriage is our savings. Because we hold the view that without savings, you cannot invest. Because investment opportunity can come and you just don't have savings. And guess what? You will not save until you keep money away from you deliberately. You will just realize you are wasting money. But here's the deal. This can only be achieved through the kind of unity we are talking about. So that we come to the point where money is below us. So we are not holding on to things. And all she told me then is what we are experiencing now. She said, why should I be bothered? You, that I know, that in one brief as a lawyer, you will pay my 35-year salary 
in the coming days of our life, I should hold on to... That, those were the things she told me. You that would take care of me anyhow, I should hold on to this change. That's what she told me. Do you get what I mean? So right now, our joint account is what we call our strong room. Two to sign, two to be in the bank. Nobody can mess up. <laughs> strong room. I'm telling you. So it's where you put money. Nobody can touch it. If I were money enters my hand, the way I save it from me, because my father and the Lord said, and I believe, money is not safe until it's safely away from you. I'm telling you. So the way I save it, after doing all I should do, all my responsibility, kingdom responsibility, hmm, sometimes to pay you, oh God, you just put that one there too. Yes. So if the family comes up with a plan, we'll stop being bothered with uh, this one, that one. A good woman would always stretch and say, I don't, I'm not using it for anything. A good man will say, you know what, you don't have to work. Because the man is going to stand up, just like God provides for his church. He's going to stand up and say, you know what, I open up my heart and God will bring the resources. That's where I am. Because how can you command the blessing when you're waiting for a woman to come and supply? My wife is not here, shall I? I'm not too. But here's the deal. I'm the leader of the pack. I can dictate how resources come in. I have a mantle on me as the man of the house to ask the Lord, you can't put me in charge of this ship and it to sink. It cannot. So money come to. All right? And I'm going to work. Because a lot of Christians are too lazy for the blessing. I think God has released the blessing, but the man is just brutally lazy. I'm telling you, I walk. Oh. I, 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 in fact, I walk. Even as I did Houston, I did walk. <laughs> you get? If I, I've been living on Nigerian time, why being here? I'm telling you, because my team are working, and I need to give them direction. So my normal wake up time is I've been here like 3 a.m. because I need to answer people who are already in court. Do you get what I mean? So men must also rise up. But every good woman knows. That that man should not stress and die because I refused to be a help. He doesn't need to ask. He doesn't need to ask. Praise God.